What's the word, y'all? It's time for us to talk about the Golden State Warriors, man. They're the, the reigning champion, and I was giving them the benefit of the doubt, but things are looking really, really bad right now. They just lost another game. They still have not won a game on the road. I mean, the, the worst teams in basketball have at least got one of those road wins. And Steph Curry just gave you 50 points on national TV against the Phoenix Suns, who are missing their, their starting point guard, and both of their power forwards are gone. One of them is at the crib tweeting, I'm not tweeting. He went to his Instagram, put a clock emoji in it, and now people think that the trade is happening like today. And then the other one, Taurus Meniscus, get well soon, Cam. So they, they're missing the starting point guard, both of their power forwards, and Steph Curry just dropped 50, and the Warriors still felt like they had no chance. I watched this entire game. There wasn't really moments where I was like, yeah, here they go, especially in that second half. Now, Steph Curry was absolutely ridiculous. 30-something points in the first half, and then in the second half, of course, slowed down a little bit, but still was damn, damn good. And they were never really, in my mind, in this game. And we got to talk about it. Again, I was giving them the benefit of the doubt. You know, we made videos about other underperforming teams, but this one, I didn't really want to come to terms with. And listen, I'm still somewhat giving them benefit of the doubt because they are the Golden State Warriors, and because I feel like, I, I don't, I can't really say they can flick a switch because a lot of things are different between this roster and the previous roster and the other rosters that won championships but i do want to say they are probably still going to be okay but let's just look at our sample size of this three weeks and, and really talk about it because bob meyer steve curran whoever's in joe lakeup whoever's in, in charge of it they need to really realize what they are dealing with right now they keep talking about straddling the line of two timelines we got the young core of pool kaminga moody Wiseman, and then we got the vets who might be on their last ride. Steve Kerr was talking about the other day, this might be the last year, next year might be the last year, but we all realize this is some of the last basketball we're going to play together. Sad to say, considering, you know, they've been a dominant force for so many years, but they're trying to, to do the young thing and the vet thing and make it work. And anytime I talk about how it just doesn't work, people like Kenny, last year, they won the championship while doing the two-line thing. Technically, sure, I'll give you that, but like, did you though? Because out of the young core I just mentioned, how many of them played legitimate rotational minutes in that playoff run? It was pool. It was J it was just JP. Uh, Moses Moody played some minutes in that Dallas Mavericks series. I vividly remember him being at the top of that zone, and he was giving Luka the fits, but Luka's still Luka. But, he, you know, he played a little bit. But the second timeline, they basically was there alone to ride clapping. You know what I'm saying? Wiseman got jewelry. He ain't played. Kaminga got jewelry. He played a little bit. So they, they did do the two-timeline thing, but now they're doing it more to the secondary timeline because guys like Otto Porter, Gary Payton the second, the, these guys are no longer on the team and it's super reliant on these young dudes. And what we found out through the first week or so is those young dudes ain't ready. So let's bring up Anthony Lamb, who's been really good. Shout out to Anthony Lamb for, for a guy that was just in the G League like two weeks ago. He's been very, very good for them. But like Anthony Lamb is playing minutes over Moody. He's playing minutes over Kaminga because they don't believe in that second timeline. James Wiseman, for, the former second overall pick a couple years removed, just got sent to Santa Cruz to play in the G for at least 10 days, according to Steve Kerr. Now, the Warriors are one of the few teams in basketball that legit uses their G League as if it was a minor league where you go go out there, you get you some reps, we're going to pull you back up, you're going to look good. They've been doing that since they, they've had the Santa Cruz Warriors. But it's just very telling that last season, once the when the Warriors turned it on, turned that flip on last season, it was after they decided to stop giving James Wiseman minutes or after he got injured or something. And then this season... Come on. Now, he's not the sole reason for all of this. And we need, we again, we need to talk about it. It's not the sole reason. But, of course, those James Wiseman minutes are dreadful. You can watch all of them. And he just doesn't, it, it, he doesn't feel, look like he have a feel for the game. He has really no touch. It's just like they were talking about sending him down so he can get some playmaking opportunities. And I'm just, like, looking at the things that he's done in his NBA career so far. I'd be like, I don't know if 10 days in the G is going to change his playmaking ability. Maybe it does. <laughs> Maybe whoever running the G over there really got that stuff, but I doubt it. So you got Steph Curry playing at an MVP caliber level, and yet we are mediocre. How? What is going on? Um, one of the reasons, we're going to go down the list of the reasons that's leading up to this and try to figure out what the solution is. One of the reasons, one that, that people are talking about very heavily, is of course, Klay Thompson. Um, Klay Thompson is having a bad, bad start of the season. So far in the season, Klay Thompson is averaging 15 points per game on 35% shooting, 33% from the three-point line, and I think he has as many free-throw attempts as games played. 
obviously a lot different than the version of Clay Thompson that me and you know and love. Um, but I, I predicted this on this on the podcast. I said that Clay was going to struggle coming out on the season just because of the two major injuries that he dealt with. I, I think a lot of people thought that because he was a part of that championship run and he played and he came back and immediately he dunked on somebody and this and that, that we're going to go back to get a near full version of Clay. And I still believe that it's so far removed from that. So I predicted that he was going to struggle. But even this struggle is a lot worse than what I even anticipated. So yeah, Clay's not hitting the shots. He he doesn't defend. He kills momentum. Uh, but that's not the sole reason, obviously, uh, that you're losing games because this was one of the top two defenses in basketball last season, and that has completely changed as well. Right now, throughout the season, they're 23. If you look at their last two weeks, it has gotten better. They're up to 14th, but still. A lot far away from what we're normally seeing from a very good version of the Golden State Warriors. Because the Golden State Warriors play such a beautiful brand of basketball throughout the Steph Curry era, I think a lot of people forget how dominant this team has been defensively in their championship runs. In 2015, they had the number one defense. In 2017, they had the number one defense. And 2018... They, they they fell a little bit this is, this is the second year of having kd i guess they didn't care as much they were like number nine and then of course the year that they just won they were top two defense has always been a part of the golden state warriors run throughout this time and right now they can't stay in front of anybody it feels like every time there is a point from the other team it's miscommunications and they're pointing at each other trying to figure it out and it's like for the for the most part a lot of these players have at least played together for a few seasons but you do have the lineup, the star lineups of Curry, Thompson, Wiggins, Green, and Looney. They have the fifth best lineup amongst qualified lineups in basketball. So, Kenny, it, it can't be those guys because, because they, that's the fifth best lineup in basketball. So, it must be what's going on on the bench. And, yeah, you, you're kind of right on that. Because when it comes to production on the bench, you do have Jordan Poole, who's averaging 17 uh, but he had 36 like two nights ago that ended up with what two points today or something like that like he he's very wishy-washy at the beginning of the season we mentioned Wiseman we mentioned Moody they've been playing Ty Jerome Kaminga I mean Jermichael Green has basically been a nothing but he's their only other big body so boom he got to play a lot of minutes and I thought it was very interesting that after their game against the Spurs I want to say Draymond Green came to the podium and he kind of gave some insight about why the second unit has been maybe uh, more lackluster than a lot of people anticipated. He mentioned that in those other finals runs or those other really good Warriors team, the team ran basically two different ways. There was a way we played basketball when Curry was on the floor, and there was a way we played basketball when Curry wasn't on the floor, and that was a headache for other teams to try to figure out how to game plan for both. But now, he, he said it in his own words that, Dream, uh, that, that Jordan Poole plays so much like Curry, we only really play one brand of basketball. When Curry's not in the game and Jordan Poole is, he is just taking the spot of Steph Curry in the same sets that we're running, and some of these other players haven't been able to really run these sets because they don't really play minutes curry so it was, a, it was some good insight from Draymond green that maybe gets you to think that things can turn around a little bit as they start to get more reps but still it has not looked nearly as good as you wanted it to i mean me and the guys were talking about on our podcast um about all of the people that got the ricky extension so far this season which one do you think people regret the most and jordan Poole was almost the unanimous one again we only talk it three weeks into a new extension a lot of things can change throughout the you know the course of it but based on what we've seen so far, that contract ain't looking too great. You know, again, I don't want you to take it out of context. I'm not saying it won't be a great contract or it wasn't overpay, but I'm literally looking at what he's been pro producing right now on court versus the other people that also got uh, rookie extensions and just he's at the bottom right now when it comes to how much money he got paid and his production. But RJ, RJ Barrett, you damn close, boy. You better get it together, man. What you start off today shooting two for 15? You got the win, so I'm giving you a little leeway. But, bro, I mean, that was a lot of money they gave you, man. <laughs> you got to step up. Anyway, back to the Warriors. So, we got Curry having an MVP caliber season. The bench is bad. What is the solution? Bob Myers and the Golden State Warriors, for as, for as long as Bob Myers has been running things over there, he's never been the guy to make the big trade come, off se or come regular season. Usually, the way they are is the way they are. It, it has to change here because, in my personal opinion, there is one timeline, and that's Steph Curry's. 
because if you look at the people that they have right now in Wiseman, in Moody, in Kaminga, in Poole, none of them are going to match what Steph Curry is doing or what he can do with a really good competent team around him. And this straddling the two timelines is not going to cut it when you're expecting timeline number number two to step up and nobody really has. I mean, we can go back to the draft classes that they've had and and dissect should they have taken uh, Kaminga, should they have taken Moody, should they have taken Wiseman. We could do that, but like they've done it already. Now we now we try to fix the thing. I mean, revisionist history when it comes to draft classes, Loki is one of the worst things. I'm being honest with you. When, when I when I see people say, oh man, my team missed out because three picks later, this player was available. It's like, yeah, but no. You know what I'm saying? Like the, the player may not have turned out the same way if they was drafted to your organization. That's kind of how I feel about the fourth overall pick of Patrick Williams. But it's also me kind of grieving with the fact that Tyrese was rumored to go fourth overall and he fell all the way down to 11th. I'm pretty sure he was rumored to go fourth overall. It was it was potentially going to happen. Uh, but any, anyway, back to the Warriors. Again, I keep getting off track. The Golden State Warriors have never been a team to make that deal come deadline. This should be the season. I've mentioned it before with the Lakers, who's just, uh, of course in a way different scenario <laughs> because they got all their draft capital and they got young players that might be interesting to some teams. But the way the league is going, and a lot of people, a lot of people are expecting there's going to be a ton of teams looking to sell come deadline, close to deadline. This draft class is stacked. And we want in. And with the people that you have, with these young players, with the draft capital that you have, I think you can legitimately go get a couple pieces. I, I can't say who exactly, but go get a couple pieces that complement what you're trying to do and fit this current timeline. Because we don't know if we're going to get the version of Klay Thompson that we want. We don't know if we're going to get the version of Draymond Green that was the, the runaway guy for defensive player of the year before he got injured. So we need to figure out the rest. And I don't even think the rest means, oh, we got to go get a superstar player. Even though there's a world where they do. Let's talk about it. Okay, it's a fictional world. It's legitimately a fictional, fictional world. Um, it's barbershop talk. I'm going to treat this this channel as if we sit at the barbershop because the brother need a, need a touch up anyway. So let's let's do it. Because um, I can definitely see going to the shop. We talk about the Golden State Warriors and somebody say, can they get Kevin Durant back? Could they? Kevin Durant just was uh, interviewed by Chris Hayes, and he talked about a lot of different stuff about his trade requests uh, in the offseason. You know, he took some some light jabs at his lineup, talking about uh, uh, Edmund Sumner and all of the people around him, and people expect us to win because of Kevin, which is facts. People expect you to win because of number seven, but damn, did you have to tell Chris Hayes, who eventually went to Bleach Report, to say it? I don't know, Kevin. Um, is there a world that they could get Kevin Durant back? I mean, I think it really boils down to how these next couple weeks go with the Brooklyn Nets. You got a report early today that Kyrie Irving will be back with the team soon. Okay, cool. They did the coaching change and it worked for a week where they looked like the best defensive team in basketball and then now they're back to being trash. Uh, Kyrie Irving comes back. Now you don't have to play so much with Evan Sumner and all these other dudes you say aren't very good, Kevin. And Kyrie is very good. So maybe things change, but if they don't and the Brooklyn Nets are looking out for their organization, uh, you should be taking calls for Kevin. And if you're looking for young talent, Plus draft capital, the Warriors have both of those things. And again, barbershop talk, me and the homies were looking around the league like what other place could Kevin go hypothetically if he decided that he wanted to move to his next destination. And the number one place was the Golden State Warriors again. I mean, looking across the league, the, the Knicks is obviously a place just because they have so much draft capital. Um, but it's just not a lot. It, I mean, it's some of the same teams that we thought about <laughs> that we thought about once he initially requested a trade. Um, but the values may be a little bit less now uh, because teams saw that the, the Denver Nuggets, nope, the Timberwolves gave up a million first round picks for Rudy and they're below 500. Two game win streak, though. Good game today. Let Bobo give you a lot of buckets, but good game today. Car Anthony Towns came to play and, and uh, Anthony Edwards had like 20 points in the first quarter. So it's coming around, gets bad teams, but you got to beat the bad teams eventually. But we could, we could be thinking smaller scale than that. Um, there's still rumors out there, even though Bojan Bogdanovic ended up signing that extension, that Bojan Bogdanovic could still potentially be moved before the deadline. The Charlotte Hornets have people like Terry Rozier, Kelly Oubre, Gordon Hayward that I'm assuming they're going to try to sell come deadline. The Bulls could legitimately be a seller come deadline. I, I honestly think I, I could see that. 
um but i do think that our front office might be a little bit too prideful to sell basically one year after building this team so maybe not but there's a world where yeah they might I think the Pacers still could potentially sell some of their pieces, you know. So there are teams around the league that have pieces that you could that would be interested in some of your stuff. I personally really love the idea of Yaka Pertle on the Golden State Warriors. I think he is an underrated passer because I always look at the Golden State Warriors center position and I look at Kevon Looney and say he is an absolute stud. So maybe we shouldn't, you know, change anything about that. But I always think that they need more depth. And I, I, but then again, they always go small when it really matters the most. But but Yaka i believe is a very underrated passer um come the short row sets really good screens plays really damn good defense so um maybe a guy that they could potentially look at just to get more depth at that center position in case something does happen balloon dog is actually so so nice so maybe not i don't know y'all i don't know i do believe that steve kerr should be trying to experiment just a little bit more and and, and i think pride is getting in the way right now and, and i just overall the love for clay thompson i think think that maybe clay would feel some type of way slash the steph curry might feel some type of way if they started to experiment with clay thompson coming off the bench at least until he got his rhythm back but then if you move thompson to the bench and i'm i'm saying that maybe jordan Poole takes a spot the second unit basically has no other ball handler other than maybe dante divincenzo so i don't i'm just spitballing right here that's what this channel is about but i do believe that there is a world where clay thompson can come off the bench for a little bit and start to get his rhythm back and then boom you can throw him back in that lineup in a little bit once he figures everything out because right now i read you the stats they are not good even today i think he ended up with 17 points like a couple of those came in garbage time so does it really count as 17 there's such a fascinating position with having an mvp caliber player and young players and draft capital now what is the value of some of these young players i don't know i think out of all of them wiseman probably has the least amount of value because we haven't seen good flashes i've seen really good flashes of kaminga when they put him in the starter lineup and everybody was injured slash resting i've seen flashes of moses moody i have not seen a flash of greatness in james wiseman just yet so he was the guy that you drafted the earliest above the mellow ball no revisionist history drafting i just said told myself we're not doing that but um those other two dudes could but also I might want to keep one of them. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. This is why I don't have one of these jobs because I, it I would go crazy trying to figure out what the hell we do. But I do believe if, if you finish this season with this roster without adding pieces, it's not going to go the way you want it. This is supposed to be the last dance. And right now, the goddamn last dance might end up in the play. -in. I highly doubt that. But you understand what I'm saying. All right. I'll see y'all.